my name is Francis Svensson, as I said, but for the recording, for the record, that's me. Um, so I have a few slides here, but <coughs> some of them are shorter, about what sign it is and what Niagara, how you use Niagara. Um, we won't be talking too much about associate uh, transformers here, but a lot of the principles hold the same. And we can talk about the, the differences for those of you in the audience that are uh, using those systems. Uh, so that's what I just said. Um, one of the uh, other important things when using a, a shared supercomputer uh, turns out not just to know how to do the things that you would do on your laptop, but now uh, at large. Um, but uh, data management and I.O. Uh, turns out to be very important. So it actually is its own section towards the end. Uh, some tips to get your stuff to work smoothly. So who is Synet? So we're Synet. We're at U of T. Um, we are a consortium uh, for high performance computing. Uh, and the consortium exists of U of T and the uh, associated hospitals all around us. Uh, that being said, though, we, uh, so we run parallel computers. Um, such as Niagara, um, but we run them not just for U of T and the hospitals, we run them for all of Canada. So any researcher, academic researcher in Canada can ask for uh, an account, uh, can ask for time on, uh, on our machines and, uh, and we will give it to them. Um, so we're not the only research, uh, not, not the only high performance computing consortia or as they tend to get branded these days, advanced research computing uh, centers. Um, there are five similar ones. There's some in Quebec, there's some in the West, there's some in the East. Um, and they all kind of run under the same premise that they run systems for anybody in Canada. So um, uh, they might have different machines than we do, and that might be the machine that you need for your research, then that's why you would compute. Um, and all of those, uh, all of that, those uh, uh, sort of collaborations are coordinated by Compute Canada. And this becomes especially important if you want to uh, run a lot of uh, uh, computations. You will need uh, some sort of allocation to make sure that you get uh, a fair share of that system that you need. Uh, to get that, you need to write an application uh, uh, for the yearly allocation competition. And that is, that is sort of done by Compute Canada. So uh, other systems that are there uh, are uh, there's cloud systems. Um, so if you're doing things like a web portal or, or uh, something like that, that's good for that. And there's general purpose machines, uh, Cedar, which is uh, hosted at Simon Fraser University, and Graham, which is in Waterloo. Um, those are general purpose. Uh, they're also the machines that have a good bit of GPU. So if you're doing a lot of, lot of GPU work, that, those are good for you. Um, and if you already have a lot of small jobs, that might be a, a good spot for them. Um, and then there's Niagara, which has been designed for large parallel computations. And, uh, and so that's what we'll be focusing on here. Um, and, and it is hosted at, the, at U of T. So. so we host the supercomputers. Um, and uh, they're available to all academics. Uh, here's Niagara. Uh, this is one row of them. There's another row um, of uh, uh, well, support nodes. It doesn't look particularly interesting, but it has 60,000 cores uh, in those few racks, uh, so it's quite a, a dense, powerful system. Um, another system we have already, SOSIP, which is a, uh, another consortium of on uh, Southern Ontario universities. It's called the Blue Gene, uh, which is, is getting a little old, but also has 65,000 cores, but very lightweight cores, and it's a very particular architecture. Now, that's only accessible, that last one, for people that have uh, a SOSIP um, project, which means that they have some sort of uh, industrial or small medium enterprise uh, collaboration with uh, with an academic uh, research project. So not everybody will have access. But Niagara is is in principle for anybody that has to do large computations. And there's a bunch of smaller ones, experimental ones. Um, there's a GPU one from SOSIP. Um, but I'll focus on Niagara here because that's that's the anything that holds for Niagara more or less holds for the other systems. Um, so we do that. We do some training too. This is your the, the first one of it. Um, we do a lot of uh, a lot of teaching in scientific programming, parallel programming, uh, data analysis, biostatistics, uh, machine learning, exactly um, all of that. 
Um, because we found that a lot of the things, the tools, the, the skills that you need to do your computation, you haven't really been taught uh, either in undergrad or grad school. Even if you know how to program, you still don't know how to apply those things at scale uh, at, and in many cases. Um, a lot of these things are, are turning out to be uh, so in demand that they've become university courses. So we have a physics course, we have a, a course in IMS, um, and we have a course in Scarborough. Um, that's how much people need this stuff. But still, we did those those courses. Are, we still have a lot of non uh, for credit courses. Another thing we do, uh, and that's, this is good timing, is summer school. So we have an uh, an Ontario HPC summer school, or really it's now more research computing summer school. Um, there are three sites in Ontario that give this summer school, and it's a week long uh, intensive program. People sit down and basically uh, hands on uh, of, of all kinds of topics uh, from Parallel programming, which is our, our original bread and butter, to um, uh, parallel Python, machine learning, uh, biomedical uh, image processing, a whole bunch of stuff. Um, the there are three sites. There's one in um, I think in London, um, Toronto, and Kingston. Um, and so, since the people that are here are probably um, uh, most likely to go to the Toronto one if that fits. Um, registration is open. You can go to the education website and find it there. Um, the registration for the for the one in London, which we call the West uh, uh, instance, is also open, but it will actually close very soon. And mm -hmm. I think today is the closing. So if you want to go to London, uh, you should register today. Um, so those are Ontario, and typically we get sort of local people. But um, there's all, we're also involved at Synet in the International HPC Summer School. So that's an international event. It'll be in the Czech Republic this year, um, but applications of that are always um, at the like end of the year, beginning of the year. Um, so that's too late. But we, we send only uh, 10 people from Canada to that conference. There will be 80 student participants. And it's, it's a, an, a very interesting um, event by itself, an international event that we do with, with our sort of sister organizations in different countries, Praise, which is the high performance computing organization in Europe, Exceed, which is the same but for the US, and Riken uh, from Japan. And that's why it's sort of a select select group and there's a, uh, there's a selection process. The Ontario Summer School, you just apply and if there's space you can come. Uh, this one's a little bit more. It's, it's all expenses paid. So you get lodging, food, and your and your uh, your travel, um, and so that's it, it's uh, it's nice. But that's so I just want to pitch that. But that's probably something you might want to look into next year. Uh, so all of that um, we sort of coordinate through our education site. Uh, you can see all of those. You can register. You can follow your progress in the certificate programs because as I already mentioned in the beginning, if you do 36 hours worth of of, uh, of courses in in the right uh, topic, then you get a certificate. We have one sort of general scientific computing certificate. Um, we have a high performance computing certificate, so that's for parallel programming and that kind of stuff. And we have a data science one where things like R, and Python, and, and SQL, that kind of stuff, uh, machine learning goes into that one. Um, we do a little research too. I didn't want to leave out the link for that. Um, so that's our teaching. We found that that's a very effective way to support our users because when they, you know, you, need, you teach a man to fish um, right, rather than give him fish. Um, but we're still here to help you. So even if after that you have something special or, or you just need help, um, a few things uh, you can do. Uh, you definitely read the wiki. Uh, we're kind of transitioning to a new wiki, so some pages are not there yet. But uh, the Niagara Quick Start is a good reference. Um, if you still need help, just write to support at sign .ca. And if you then still need help, if by email we can't, right, we, we just will ask you to come in or you can ask to have a one-to-one -one consultation right here in the offices. Um, uh, or if you're not here, we can, we can do it over, over the phone. Um, don't be afraid to contact me. We're here to help you. Right? And most of us, uh, I'll show you who we are. Uh, this is us. Uh, most of us actually have a background in science or in scientific computing. Um, so we kind of artificially divide our uh, fairly small group, what is that, 15 people maybe altogether, um, into um, analysts and sysadmins. So the analysts would do the software, user support, training, those are sort of the outward facing 
uh, frontline people and, and analysts and, and uh, sysadmins, which make sure that all of the stuff works. Um, but it's artificial. Um, if you, you, would, you would still be in touch with some of those people because also because not only these people have a, a scientific background and PhD in various fields, uh, these guys do too. So they might uh, go, well, I might be officially a sysadmin, but I know exactly how to solve your molecular dynamics problem, and I'm just going to reply to that email. And that's why all the emails should go to, to support us, I know that you um, just so that the whole group will see it and you'll get a, an answer very quickly. Um, we borrow a few people from SOSIP that, that basically mostly work on the blue gene and the, and the SOSIP uh, SGC. Um, we have a technical officer, we have a scientific director, Professor Paul J from, uh, from physics, um, and uh, our business manager. And so this is, these are all the people that make this possible, um, and you'll see their names uh, as you uh, use Synet. Okay, so that's, that's who we are, that's who you'll, you'll uh, interact with. Uh, this is what you interact with, or most of you anyway. This is Niagara, it's brand new. Uh, it came online in April, or at least uh, for, for users. Uh, and it's actually kind of a, an interesting uh, machine in how uninteresting it is. It is 60,000 Intel chips, pretty much the same kind of chips that you would find in a modern laptop, um, just a little beefed up, obviously. Um, and they're, they're in 1,500 nodes, so it's basically all 40 core machines and then 1,500 of them. Um, the generation, of course, is called Skylake. Um, they run at 2.4 gigahertz. Um, they have 40 cores, but they can hyperthread, so they pretend to have 80 cores for the most part. Um, the whole machine can uh, can deliver three petaflops, which is petaflow to point operations per second. It's a benchmark that every supercomputer does to make sure that they know where they rank on on the list. Nobody runs uh, that particular benchmark as a real. Thing, but it still gives you an idea of where you are. So if we had been operational in November 17, that should say not 18, um, then we would have been at the, the 42nd fastest uh, supercomputer on the earth, at least that people want to know about, uh, want to make public. Uh, each node has 40 cores. It has about 200 gigabytes of RAM, uh, if you count the powers of 10, um, which means about four gigabytes per core for, for your jobs. And the, uh, the operating system on this Linux, uh, what does set this system apart is its, is its network. Um, the, uh, it has what's called an InfiniBand interconnect. So rather than just having Ethernet cables, there's a, there's a faster interconnect. Um, and a couple of things are nice about that. First, it's, it's faster by itself. It tends to have much lower latency than just uh, doing regular uh, cabling between nodes. Um, but also, um, it, it's, it's set up in, in four parts, four se sections. Each, each quarter of the system is essentially one-to-one uh, -one connected. So there's a direct link between every node to every other node, which means you can run up to 1,700 and something, 70,000 and something cores uh, jobs uh, where every node can see the other node directly without any traffic interference. Um, and beyond that, that's this, this beauty of the Dragonfly Plus. Uh, you can run larger and then traffic is actually rerouted as if uh, this were a smart city, uh, 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 it, there's a depth grounding. So it's very nice, uh, pretty fast. That's why uh, you actually get most of the, uh, the, the speed up uh, of this. Uh, but it doesn't have, for instance, GPUs. A lot of modern supercomputers will probably come with GPUs. Um, it also doesn't have any local disks, because local disks are spinning all the time, which costs energy. And um, there's a nice parallel file system that we have. So, it's boring in the sense that it is a very homogeneous system. You just basically have a whole bunch of compute nodes. There is a, uh, a node at the end, uh, sorry, a, a system at the end that does the file system and, and everything is fine. It makes it simple, but why did we choose such a kind of simple system with no GPUs and not all kinds of things is that we actually asked people that run, users that we knew were running on the GPC and other systems in Canada. They were running large shops. We asked, what do you need to run? How large do you need to run and what can you code accommodate? And by and large, they said, we can't really grow with GPUs. GPUs are probably great, but we are running on CPUs and that's how we can scale. Um, and then we made a benchmark based on that saying, okay, um, let's have some GPU enabled applications and some not and ask, okay, what is gonna be the performance of this suite of benchmarks? And what came out is that if you put GPUs in the mix, you can get so much less 
computing power for the applications that need the CPUs that at the end of the day, it turned out to be best just to have a full CPU uh, system. And of course, it did help that we know that Cedar and Gray and the other general purpose machines have GPUs. So it's not like we're, we're disabling that, but you can't run that stuff here. So that's Niagara. Um, any questions about what we are and, and what we have before we, we go into the, uh, the details of how to use it? But I'm just curious, how, yeah. how much faster is this than the general purpose company? Um, so, so where we have, uh, what, what's it? we have about three petaflops here. We had 300 uh, before, 300, uh, what is that, teraflops. So it's about 10 times faster. And it takes about, what was it, 80% of the energy. So it's en more energy efficient for 10 times the power. So um, the, it is aimed at large jobs. So uh, I should see a 40 core. So if you're running a lot of small jobs, which might still be possible, but a lot of serial jobs, you have to bundle up to run 40 at the same time. We had a similar situation at GPC where you had to bundle up with eight. You just now have to try a little bit harder to make that bundling work. Um, so there's, uh, there is that. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's faster, smaller <laughs> almost. In terms of, of uh, physical space, it's smaller too. So, yeah. Okay, so how do you use this? How do you get in? What, what is there to, to use and, and how? Um, so first you wanna log in. Um, all the systems at Signet and all the systems in Compute Canada, uh, basically um, you access through SSH. So that's a secure shell. Um, it's, everything is command line based on supercomputers. Um, there's not much to do about that. Uh, so if you're coming from a Windows machine, you'll need to have something that can do SSH. Um, we kind of like Mobile Xterm. It's easy to install. You install it Windows, and you can you can SSH in. And then um, for most cases, once you have a terminal, either from a Linux machine or a Mac machine or uh, or Mobile Xterm on Windows, but you will work too. But you'll have to try a little harder if you need anything graphical. Um, you SSH with SSH um, dash Y, which is optional but needed if you do anything graphical like opening a new window. Um, and then your username at niagara.signet.utoronto.ca or your username at niagara.computecanada.ca. Both work, they're just aliasing for, for the same system. Uh, what's important to know is your username here is your Compute Canada username. So uh, it used to be, and it's to some extent still is, uh, that you have two accounts to get onto Signet. You have your Compute Canada account, which you will need for all kinds of admin stuff. And then you would have a local account with, with Signet that you would use to log in. Um, now you still have to ask for a Signet account if you want access to Niagara, just because we have, that actually sort of triggers the creation of your home directory and things like that. And they'll they'll eventually become a little bit different. In principle, you just need your Compute Canada account to log in, and so you log in with your Compute Canada username and your Compute Canada password. So whatever you used on the CCDB side, so the Compute Canada database side, when you first sign up, that's what you will need. Uh, the, if your passwords are not the same, the sign up password will not work here. So that's, that's different. Um, another difference, which is kind of nice, uh, is that when you log in into Niagara, that node that you're on is a Devel node. So there's no distinction anymore between a login node and a Devel node where you log in and you SSH to another node to compile. You log into Niagara, you're in a Devel node and you can compile there um, and, and do small tests. Um, but these log, but they're not part of Niagara compute clusters. So we, have, we have those 60,000 cores. The machines you end up with here are what we call the login nodes. Um, so they're separate, that's, that's, that's good to extent, but there's also shared. So every, there's a whole bunch of users running at the same time. They might not be part of the cluster, but it's the same architecture, uh, virtually the same kind of memory, uh, the same software stack. So anything that works on the, uh, on these login nodes should work on the compute nodes uh, for, except for one thing. We'll, we'll get to that. Uh, the dash Y is optional, but if you want to open, say, a, a new window from your command line, uh, you'd have to do some things. That's a detail. Um, so, as I said, it's not really part of Niagara as such. It's just separate nodes to log in and to compile it. To really run on Niagara, you have to submit a batch job. So we, so we separate Niagara into the login nodes and the compute nodes. The compute nodes are those 60,000 cores. There's about 1,500 nodes. That's, that's where you compute. It has to go through a batch system. 
So the login notes are just shared. You log in. There's a whole bunch of users who all kinds of things. It gets slow if there's a lot of users. Um, the other nodes, the compute nodes, are, are are allocated by a scheduler. And the scheduler makes sure that everything is fair. There's a there's a queue. You submit a job. Um, if there's space, it will run it right away. But there's never space. There's always more people wanting to run than there is. So you wait a while, and then how long you wait depends on a whole bunch of factors. Like, um, did you get an allocation for a certain amount of time? Um, is there even a swap available somewhere? How much did you run in the past? Um, some limits that there might be on, and we'll get to those. But uh, that schedule arranges all of that and tries to make sure that, that it, it's sort of fairly done. People that have gotten an allocation get their work done. People that are uh, what we call uh, default or rapid access people um, still get some stuff done. And depending on how big their jobs are or how much they've done in the past, other people get a turn to so it's that schedule as well. Mm -hmm. uh, how I can log in, for example, I connected uh, uh -huh. to one of the login nodes, right. and I, I'm using a screen. And, uh, when I, I uh, accidentally disconnect, mm -hmm. how can I log into the same machine that... You can, you can do two ways. You can actually just log in and then an SSH to the one that you know you were in. So you'd, you'd have mm -hmm. to figure out a host name. And they're all called Naya Login 01, 02, 03. Mm -hmm. So you could do that. Um, you could also cheat and check what the IP address is when you log in and mm -hmm. go directly through the IP. You could do that too. Um, I don't know by heart what the IP address is. So I don't, I don't want to do that. But yeah, you will have to SSH either two steps or, uh, yeah. Like the old one, did you? Yeah, yeah. Then, then it becomes like that. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, so you're in, um, but where are you, um, and, and what do you have in terms of storage spaces? So there's there's a couple of storage systems we have, um, and there's a couple of locations for you to put files in. It's a shared system. The, all of the file systems are are uh, parallel shared file systems. That means that. Um, all the nodes see the file systems. When you run on a compute node, you don't have to transfer any files. They're already there. It's all mounting the same file system. It's a, it's a powerful file system, but it is shared. And so um, you have actually two spots on them. You have a home directory, which is of moderate size, about 100 gigabytes, not too small, but which is backed up. You can put your stuff there. And then there's a scratch directory, which we'll use for anything that's larger or anything that you have to write to uh, in compute jobs. Um, they have kind of longish actual paths, home, G is the first letter of your group, you're all in a group, uh, the group name, which is which is typically the username of your PI, your, your supervisor, or if you're the supervisor of yourself, and then your CC username. Uh, and Scratch is similar, which <coughs> starts differently. Now, you don't always want to write that whole uh, long uh, uh, directory path, um, so you should use the the environment variables dollar home and dollar scratch. As I said here, if I log in and I type pwd, which is for present working directory, it shows me uh, this path for my home directory. I'm the sign it group, and so that's here. If I change to the scratch directory where I have way more space and where I can write to in jobs, um, I'm, looks like the same path, but the beginning is different. Okay, so everybody has some space on there. And it's important to have both because we've actually locked down home to not be writable from the compute nodes. Um, prevents ac uh, accidents like overwriting your home directory from a from a compute job or uh, general slowness on the home directory as well. Um, scratch is where you would write your results in, in jobs. Now, if you have a an allocation, you get a second when you have asked for for actual storage space that uh, that, that you need. You can have a project location. And so that will be, again, in dollar projects. Um, if you don't have a project, dollar project will say something like, you don't have a project uh, directory. So, uh, uh, But if you do, it will be similar. Uh, uh, use these variables. Um, we've had, at least once, a case where we had to change the structure of the file system. Uh, and people that used the, the environment variables could uh, still use their scripts. And people that had hard-coded these paths did not. Uh, also, these paths are different on Cedar and Graham. So if you're running both on those machines and on Niagara, if you want anything that's slightly portable, if you use the environment variables, then those scripts will be portable because their homes and scratch are in different locations, but they have a dollar home and a dollar scratch to find. Uh, yeah. Is there any purge policy for the yes. scratch folder? Yes, yes. So we'll get to that here. So there's limits both in space and time. Uh, on, on all these locations. So home is 100 gigabytes, 
Um, it is backed up. You can uh, you can see it on the login and on the compute nodes, but on the compute nodes you can only read from home. So home is good to have sort of static data or applications, uh, but if you want to write things out, which you in, in variable want to do, uh, you have to be on Scratch. For Scratch you have, we could call it the quota of 25 terabytes. It's not really a quota because there's not enough space for everybody to have 25 terabytes on Scratch. It's just space for you to, to sort of use uh, temporary uh, anything that has to stick, you either copy back to home or, or to another place. Um, there's an expiration time on that to make sure that this is temporary data. So anything that's not used on Scratch for two months gets deleted. Um, this works as politely as we can make it. Um, on the first of the month, if you have anything on Scratch that is, is slated for deletion, you will get an email say, here's the list of uh, files that will be deleted in two weeks if you don't do anything. And then uh, about two days before we actually do it, I think we send an update. We say here are the like you probably moved some things away or 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 change them or access them. Make sure that they aren't going to get deleted. You get another email saying, "Hey, there's still some stuff left." If what's on that list is okay with you to be deleted because it was temporary data and you just forgot to delete it yourself, leave it be and it will be deleted. Okay. Um, and so we, every month we check which which files will be older than two months. Uh, in, in, in that two week window. It's not backed up, so you really have to think of this as temporary data. We tend to not lose data, but uh, you know you could accidentally remove something or your jobs might overwrite the directory was already there. Uh, we have no way to recover things. For home, we can. Um, it's backed up in the sort of uh, safeguard way, so don't ask us for your file from a year back. Um, and, and the backup from, from that time, no, we just have a recent backup and if something goes wrong, contact us immediately and most likely we still have your files. That kind of backup, it's a safety net. Um, you can, uh, so you can use this on login and on compute in the same way. If you have projects, the biggest difference is that there's no expiration and that it is backed up. So if you have more than this 100 gigabytes of data and you need that project space, ask for it. In the, in the early allocation round. Okay. If you need a little bit, if you go, okay, I have a, pro, uh, like a collaboration or everybody's sharing data, we have to have a little bit, talk to us. We can, we can typically give small amounts of project to people that have a use case for it, that happen to ask for it, but it's small. Like you won't get more than a terabyte probably. And that's, that is if, if, if that. Um, and it's just, we don't have that much project. It's not because we're stingy, that we really don't have that much project space. We have to back it all up. Um, those are the ones that I already told you about. There's two other ones. Um, one is an archival system. It's called HPSS. It's state backed. Um, it's kind of different. Um, it's not on any node. You have to write a script to copy things from one to the other. But if you have data that has to stick around for a while, say you don't need it, but maybe in six months you might need it because you know, a referee was, was insistent on doing another analysis of your data or something like that, um, that's a good spot to keep it. Um, and then there's a, a fifth one, which is the burst buffer. It's a faster uh, storage system than Scratch, um, but there's not as much of it. So this is this is currently being used on request. People doing very heavy I/O um, should run on that because it, the, the I/O of Scratch and Home isn't bad, but it's it but it's also not fantastic if everybody's using uh, a lot of a lot of uh, I/O operations. Um, so it's good for things like checkpointing and heavy I/O. Um, this one really is, is super, sort of a super scratch, I like to think of it, um, a very short expiration time. Um, so even if you have data on that in, in, in 48 hours, it should be gone um, and, and you, not backed up either, uh, but available on login and, and computers. Okay, so that's what we have. Those are the limits. Um, be careful to keep your scratch as lean as you can. Um, this tends to fill up regardless of our purging policies. Um, you know, it, this is kind of uh, the way things are. Yeah. What's the storage uh, limit for the scratch for the group? I think it's it depends on the number of users you have. So, th so I forgot the exact, but it's something like if you have n users, you have 10 times n terabytes, something like that, up to a, a, a reasonable limit. I don't think anybody gets more than 500 terabytes, even if they had a huge you, group. Do you include this usage? Sorry? This usage, the command. Oh, the command. There is a right. for command disk 
Yes. Yeah, there's you exactly how much. Uh, yeah. You can try. I think the U has to be capital. Yeah. Yeah. This usage. Tell you how much space you have yeah. per user and per group. Yeah. So when you have this space. How do you get your stuff on there? Not everybody has to move their data, but a lot of people do. Um, and there's, there's sort of a rule of thumb. Uh, but the login notes being shared and being not meant for actual computations have a safeguard that uh, people can't run more than I think it's an hour at most uh, of anything. And you should actually not try to do an hour, but you know, long transfers of files from one end to the other, uh, going over SSH. Well, SSH is encrypting, and so encrypting means decrypting on the other end. That's a computation, and so it can happen that if you have a lot of data, like several dozen gigabytes, that you try and copy them over through the login nodes, and it times out. So. If it's not that, if you've got like a thousand gigabytes or something, or, or probably even 20 terabytes, 20 gigabytes would work, you can just S copy it or R sync it or you can win SCP or whatever you want to copy your files to Niagara. Um, but anything larger likely will time out. And then you can use what's called the data mover nodes. So these are, these are really just nodes meant for moving data. Um, and they have, this, I don't think it's, yeah. So you can do Naya, Naya Data Mover 1. I think Naya-DM1 works as well. Um, you log into there, and then you can copy uh, from that node. And that node has no timeout. It has a faster connection to the outside world. There is a, uh, there's a gotcha here. Um, you can't see the Data Mover node from the outside. So you have to start from the Data Mover and pull your data in. Uh, if that's a problem, because you are also behind a firewall, you can either talk to us. Uh, we don't tend to open firewalls, but we can tell your IT people that they should open their firewall and we can be very persuasive. And if even that doesn't work, um, you can consider using Globus, which is a web-based interface, um, which I won't talk too much about, but you can look on the wiki how, how to use it. Uh, it's kind of nice because you can actually say, copy this directory either from your local machine or from another supercomputer to that directory in, in Niagara. And it sort of happens behind the scenes. Once you've sort of triggered that, um, it will retry if it fails. You can uh, you should switch off your computer if the data is there. But but other than that, it, it sort of fire and forget. It's kind of nice, but there's some setup to to do that. So do this if you if you have a lot of uh, uh, large transfers to do often. It's quite nice. Otherwise, either just go through the login nodes or use the data movers. And if you have any trouble with that, just, just ask us. Um, HPSS um, is is our tape best like sort of archive near line whatever you want to call it. Um, it's good for keeping things for long term, uh, as I already said. It's kind of funny because you have to use uh, a scheduler. Basically, you, you ask the scheduler, hey, at some point, could you please copy uh, this data to there? Um, and that's because it's tape, tape backed. It means there's tape drives involved. It means that at some point, all the drives are full. And I forgot when we have five or 10 or something. You've got a good few, but when they're full, there's no point in trying to do more. So that's why there's a schedule. Uh, to, to make sure that happens. It's more or less first, first come, first serve. Um, and storage on there is also done through the, the same allocation process. Um, but if you ask nicely, we can give you a little bit of space there. Um, but that's OK. So that's the data part of it and how you get data and, and where, where it resides. So kind of clear. You know, you want to do something with that data. So you need some software. Right? What can you run? Um, and especially with a, a wide variety of users like, like we have in this room, um, we can't actually install a whole bunch of software that is just available to you because most of the software will not like the other software that's there or will have a command that's the same name but means something completely different. So other than really essential things for the operating system and for uh, a few other things, all the installed software is, is hidden. It's not there. It seems like there's nothing installed. And that's because it is installed, but it's not installed in a standard location. Because it's not in a standard location, the operating system, by default, doesn't know where it is, which is good, because then it can't conflict with other ones. This module system um, is there to make sure you can now basically let the operating system know, oh, there is this software, and there it is. Uh, and so it 
the way it works is just setting some variables, uh, paths, uh, library path, uh, things like that, maybe a few environment variables that, that, uh, that make this possible. Now, we're using a version of, of the module command called lmod. On the GPC, we had uh, a module command, I think it's the official name. Um, it works a little bit different than, than before. Um, the current setup of Niagara is, is such that it tries to only show those modules that you can actually load. So um, if you've worked on the GPC before, you knew that it could be quite difficult to find a combination of modules that work for you and aren't conflicting with one another or other things you have loaded. Um, this system is, is such that if you ask for what modules are available, um, you actually get a pretty short list with not everything because it's only what is available now. So let me show you how that, how that works. Um, if you want to know what is available, the command to use is module spider. And module spider will give you everything that's there. Um, and so we'll start with ccnv, nyaenv, anaconda, auto tools. It's alphabetical. Uh, so your favorite package is probably somewhere down the list. This will tell you if it's actually there. Um, if it's there, you should in principle be able to load it with a command called module load. So it doesn't install it, it's already installed, right? But it just sets those variables and so it's fairly quick. And then after that, the binaries, the library should all be accessible. Um, once you've loaded a whole bunch of them and you want to start over, module purge can get rid of all of the loaded modules. Um, if you want to know if a module is there, there's a the module spider command. It will get back to that one. Um, if you want to know what you can load now, there's module avail. Module avail was a, a main tool on the GPC to know what's available. It gave you all of the modules. You try to load, it'll tell you if you couldn't. Um, with this system, module avail has limited power. So it'll only show you what can be loaded. Um, so for instance, if, if well, well, we'll see in a second how it works. Um, if you want to know what you loaded currently, you do module list. So a lot of these things are very similar to what was on the GPC, but a spider is, is different and it's because you can't see everything. Um, in addition, we actually decided to give Niagara two software stacks. Um, there is a specific Niagara software stack with tuned libraries and applications for these Skylake nodes, these, which are the newest generation, uh, compiled for, for our machine, make sure that they work. Um, some of them were vendor uh, specific uh, packages that came with the machine. They're all in this Niagara stack. And you have that one by default, but if for some reason it, that stack gets lost, you can do module load Niagara for the short for Niagara environment. Um, however, there is a second environment that uh, is the software stack that's available on Graham and Cedar. And this can be very convenient. If you have something that already works in Cedar or Graham or something that isn't installed in the in the Niagara specific stack, um, you, can, you can do this. Uh, you can load the CC environments. And that gives you an environment that is very, very similar to that on Cedar and Graham. In principle, it's identical. Um, and and it, it, all, the, all the modules will be there. Now, one thing that we do different from those general purpose machines, Cedar and Graham in Niagara, is we don't load any modules by default. Um, if you have worked on Cedar and Graham, you, when you log in, there's an Intel module loaded, there's uh, uh, some MPI version is loaded, uh, some other things are loaded by default. Um, we've chosen not to do that because from our experience with the GPC, we find that eventually people will try and use different versions than what are the defaults. And uh, in the best case, you just get some warning outputs in your jobs. You go, is, should I be worried? Um, for full control, it's best not to have any modules loaded by default and just load them when you start working, uh, either in your job scripts or, or not. So now if you do want those standard things that were loaded in Cedar and Graham, there's, there's a package called stdenv, and if you load that to, you get something that looks just like Cedar and Graham. Okay. So for those people that need to do that, fine. Um, um, there's a lot of stuff that works here. It is tuned. Um, we would prefer you using this, but if something isn't working for some reason or is not available, um, uh, this, is, this is there for you. Okay. This works kind of funnily the way it's set up is different from Cedar and Graham where they have local disk and things are cached. So this tends to be a little slower as well. Um, we can't help that. Uh, we can help this. And so we make this as, as nice as we can. Um, we'll talk about that in a second. Okay, so 
before I say how you find your actual modules now, which is not terribly hard, um, a few more tips. Uh, don't put any modules in your .bashrc. If you know what a .bashrc is, you know it's a file that is loaded when you log in, and uh, you could do things in it like um, set your prompts to whatever you want and load some modules by default so that you don't have to load them. Uh, don't do that latter thing. Don't do that because uh, invariably um, you will use some other modules and you forgot that they were there and now your jobs won't either either fail or will give you funny messages with oh uh, you were trying to load r but you already have anaconda loaded and it'll say no, that's not working. so try so it's best not to do that just put the explicit modules you need in your javascript put the explicit modules you need either type them in a command or if you have a lot of them just put them in a uh, in a file and, and and load them like that also i would advise not to use default versions. Um, so you would have seen in the list of packages here, here they are, that sometimes you have several versions of a product, of a, of a software. CMake 3.10.2 and CMake 3.10.3. One of them will be the default. You can just say module load CMake and you'll probably get the latest one, um, which, which is nice if you're just playing around. But once you get to production, you want to be specific. Why? Because new modules will be added and if you need to rerun something two months later and you just said module load cmake uh, you'll get the then newest version and you might get different results right so it's a little unscientific to keep just saying that when you're playing around you're just loading, loading modules it's very useful the other thing is that this process will continue and um, on the gpc if you loaded the indel module i think you got one from 2012. Um, Nobody should be using that anymore, but that just happened to be the default we set at some point. So don't trust our defaults. Be specific. Um, there's some abbreviations that's handy. If you want to load list your modules, you can just, instead of saying module list, you say ML. If you want to load, load a module, you say ML in the name of that module. Um, if you want to do ML, module spider, you can do ML spider. Um, after a while, um, you forget that you, the real command is module, and you just type ML. So those are tips on, on, on what to do. Um, now, there are packages out there that need other packages. So for instance, if we have FFTW, which is a library to do Fourier transforms, it might have been compiled with an Intel compiler or a GCC compiler. And so you ha will have to load those compilers before you can load that particular library. Um, and so if you try to do this, on Niagara and you haven't loaded those libraries, you'll get messages like this. Um, if you do module load open MPI, which is an MPI uh, uh, a parallel programming library, um, you will get LMOD has detected an error. So LMOD was this module system, so that's why there's LMOD there. Um, these modules exist but cannot be requ requested. So open MPI, if it doesn't exist, if you did a spelling mistake, it would tell you that. Um, now, how do I load it then? It exists, but I can't. It can't do it. But it gives you a hint. It says, try this, module spider open MPI. Um, so we try it, module spider open MPI, and you find that there are actually several versions of open MPI. I think we have actually more than three now. Um, and still doesn't tell you anything, but it does say, oh, by the way, if you want more information on any of these versions, just type module spider open MPI slash, and then the version. So we try that. Module Spider open MP3.1 and says, yeah, I can find that one. And then it gets a little bit more specific and says, if you want to load these modules, then you need to load this set of modules. So either one of the lines, so either this one or that one. So it tells you that we have OpenMPI available for GCC and for Intel. And both of them are in the Naya and set. So we try that module load, Naya Env Intel, we choose the second one. Um, Naya Env is probably already loaded, the, the, you can just do Intel. Uh, and then we can do module load, open MPI, and it no longer gives you any warning for any message. And whenever something gives you no return value in Linux, it means it succeeded, or you got disconnected. Um, module list will then tell you that these were in the drum. So this is how you find your modules. You do a module spider, you will find them, you, you'll try and find the right version, and, and after a while you know what's, what's up. Does that make sense? It's a little bit different from the GPC, but a little bit more guided than, uh, than just trying to load modules and hoping for the best.
commercial software. Um, we get requests for that sometimes. Like, can we run Abacus? Can we run Ansys? Can we run you know, Gaussian? Um, maybe, uh, but we don't have licenses. And the part of this same idea of having a large user base, we just don't have a budget for buying everybody's favorite license for 1,500 nodes. This is not possible. But if you have a license, then we can work with that. Um, so if you bring your own license, and um, we've done it for quite a few groups, um, either because your group is running a license server or you have a license file or some other way, uh, we can make it work. Okay, so if, that's, if, you're, if you're really uh, dependent on that, that's how it will work. But uh, basically just contact us and we'll, we'll guide you through the process. Um, if you don't have to, and then we would say, well, try something open source. Um, if you're using MATLAB, maybe your script will work in Octave, which is not only free, but also means that you could run it on many more nodes at the same time because there is no license uh, limit. And maybe your scripts will work in Python or R. Uh, so those are available too. Uh, we'll have to help you. Uh, some of this software is also in the Compute Canada stack, but again, you'd still have to somehow provide your own license. Just because they have the software installed doesn't mean you can use it because the license would be missing. So that, it's just generally an, an issue. Okay, so suppose we're in, we've just loaded nothing yet, uh, and we have some software to compile. Let's say that's our use case, what we do. So we have Naya env loaded, and then we go, okay, let me load the Intel compiler, and let me load a library called GSL, and it's just to show you an, an example of another module. Um, suppose I have two C codes that I need to compile. Um, usually, you'd have a make file or a C make file or something like that. Um, but to be explicit, you could compile these with the Intel compiler. The Intel compiler is called ICC. Uh, and the thing that I want to point out here is whenever you compile yourself, make sure you optimize uh, or give the flags to your compiler to optimize. Don't start tweaking with the code. Um, and it's fairly easy. Uh, you give dash O, O for optimization. That's the letter O, not the number. And three or two or the, some level. Um, and then uh, X host, which optimizes for the host, which means you get the optimal code for these Skylake processors. Uh, it's easy to forget these things. Uh, some build systems don't put them in at all. And why don't they? Because they want you to build software that will run on any machine. But you don't want to run on any machine, you want to run on this machine. So that's not why. Um, and then uh, everything kind of works automatically um, uh, in that if we file these and then we link them, uh, we give the library, the GSL library, and it also needs the MGL. It's a math kernel library. It comes with the Intel compiler. Um, and, and we could run our code. Uh, if we didn't load the modules, the ICC command wouldn't work. If we didn't load GSL, then it wouldn't find a library here. But once we've loaded them, it works as if they were installed in the standard locations. That's how it's supposed to work. When it doesn't work, and it typically is if you use some build system, um, just contact us and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll try and figure it out. Most stuff works out of the box once you detect the works. Okay, this is for people that have to run or compile their own code, but even if you're just running R, you still want to do module load R or module load Anaconda or something like that. Okay, next step should be testing. So if you've got your code, uh, you compiled it or you, know, you, you downloaded it or you wrote your script, um, test this stuff. Um, the way it works, and we'll see that in a second, is when we schedule your jobs, we schedule by node. That means that every job has at least 40 cores available to it, uh, which means that if your job doesn't work and it's just spinning its wheel for 12 hours, that's a lot of cores wasted. So we'd like you to try and make sure that your stuff works on small scale because then uh, you know that if you submit it, you have a good chance it will work. So test your stuff. And you can run small tests. And, and by small tests, I mean something that takes a couple of minutes or a couple of gigabytes. Or even just starting your stuff. If it doesn't take a lot of memory, but you just want to know if it gets started. Because usually, in most cases, if it doesn't work, it crashes early. Right? There are some things that happen later, but most things that go wrong, you know, a library is not found. Uh, you forgot to load your modules, for instance. Or uh, you run out of memory, and there's actually a memory limit on those nodes. You'll find it very quickly. Um, there's you know, a programming error and the output is nonsense. You'll see it right away. So testing in that sense is very easy. Um, you can also use a debugger. Uh, we have one commercial debugger called DDT. So we, that is very, it's graphical and, and kind of intuitive. 
Uh, you can do that. You can use the old style GDB as well um, if you want to debug your code. And so short test, but do not fit on a login node. This, this can happen. So suppose that you do need to run a short test, but it takes 200 gigabytes of RAM, and you'll okay, that's not going to work on the login node. Or um, you find problems with your parallel program, but it only occurs when you're doing, say, 10 cores or 12 cores or something. You want to test it on a larger scale. Um, you can ask for a short interactive uh, job. So these will run on the complete nodes. You have a debug job and how many nodes you want. Uh, often one node is enough because you have 40 cores here. Um, and you'll get a, a new prompt that'll, that will live on one of the compute nodes. That compute node is yours. Um, there's nobody else on that one compute node. Um, so, and with interactive jobs, typically you're not using much, right? You're most of the time spending typing and then running something and it crashes when you're typing. So, um, that's why these sessions are kept short. You can't run this for more than an hour. Um, because it's in a sense wasteful, but it's necessary, right? You need to figure out what's wrong. Um, so you get a session for an hour, if you have one job, one node, and you can just try things, and that node is yours. Also means that things like timing your algorithm, like how fast is my code, is sort of more predictable. On the login nodes, when you try things, there could be a hundred other people running other stuff. So, you know, it might run, but the time that it takes is completely meaningless because other stuff is running too. On these machines, on the end of the bug job, you know exactly what's running, so you can set it, you know how fast it's supposed to be. With the only exception being the file system. If you write to the file system and other people are writing the crazy on the file system too, that timing can vary. But everything else that's not disk based um, is very reliable. You can go up to four nodes. That gives you 160 cores. If you can't debug your job in 160 cores, uh, please come talk to us because then we probably need some help. Um, and you can have only one session at a time. It is interactive. Um, and so you can't have two windows open with two debug node jobs because. So suppose everything is working right. And uh, the kings are ironed out. Now uh, you need to submit a job. So now you want to run, say, 100 of these, and uh, uh, they'll take six hours, and they'll each can take 40 cores, and you're good. You're good to go. Um, you can submit a script to the scheduler. Our scheduler is called STIRM. And uh, STIRM is, uh, uh, I think it stands for Simple Linux Universal Resource Manager. Um, so you submit something through the s batch command, and this, this something is a job script, and I'll show an example of them in a second. Um, it puts a job in the queue with all of the other uh, requests to run uh, from all the other uh, users, and it prioritizes it based on your allocation, based on, uh, on your group, based on how much you've run in the past, based on how big your job is. Um, there's a slight bias towards larger jobs on Niagara because that's what it's intended for. Um, and that's et cetera. Um, scheduling is by node, as I already mentioned. So you have to ask for a multiple of, of 40 cores or multiple of nodes. It's the best, the best way to think about it. Um, there's a limit to how long you can run. Uh, if you have one of these allocations, it's 24 hours. If you don't, it's 12 hours. That seems short to some people. This was 48 hours at the, uh, in, in the old GPC, so that's considerably shorter. Um, but it's kind of necessary to make it possible to run large jobs. If you imagine if you want to run on, say, 500 nodes, and we have a job like that, um, and nodes are already used for two days, then at least half of them will not be used for a day on average, if you think about it. And so that's a lot of waste. If we keep a maximum of, of 12 hours or 24 hours for the people, that's really for people that run large anyway, so that's the people that are targeted here, um, you might be wasting like six hours or something uh, a couple of hundred nodes, which is still bad, but at least you, you can enable these, these large jobs. So uh, that's that's what it's for. It's safer for you to be able to run in that way, uh, because suppose you did run a two-day job, and at hour 23, our power gets cut off because there's a, a, a thunderstorm or something. It happens, right? Not often, but it happens. You've lost 23 hours of, of work. Um, in this case, you'd run and you lose at most uh, 12 hours of work. So it's kind of safer to make sure that you can you can restart uh, in this way. 
And I already mentioned that home is read-only, so you must write to scratch or project if you have it. Another thing that is something to keep in mind is no, there's no internet access from the compute nodes. Um, so if you have any data that has to be downloaded, do it first. Don't put it as part of your job script. Uh, it's probably a good idea anyway, because if you download the job, then you might not quite know how long that's going to take. And um, now you don't know how much time to ask for in your job script, and it might time out. Um, so, that's, so the fact that home is read-only and there's no internet accesses are the two main differences between the compute nodes and the login nodes. Other, other than that, things that work on the login nodes should work on the compute nodes. And then there's Slurm. Um, we were running Moab and Torp on the other systems before, and this is what we were used to. Uh, Slurm calls things a little bit differently, and, and we find it is a, a, a little bit micromanaging the, the system. So it's good to know a few terms. I won't go in every detail because jobs and nodes make sense. But uh, when you ask for resources, you have to say how many nodes you want. But if you're doing computations with, let's say, MPI, you also have to say how many MPI processes you intend to run. And if you want, uh, and if that's not the same as the number of cores you're running on, you better also say how many cores there should be per MPI process. Um, even if you're not doing this, but you're just running uh, sort of other parallel tasks, uh, it's important to understand the, the nomenclature here. So um, usually when people talk about parallel, pro parallel computing, you're either running one big program with a bunch of threads inside it, so different cores are giving different things within the same program, or you're running separate programs that communicate with one another. The latter thing is often done with MPI, message passing interface, those little different programs communicate that way, and there is called threading. Um, so when you want to run MPI processes through Slurm, you have to ask for a number of tasks. So when you have a 40 process MPI uh, application, you have to ask for 40 tasks. So rather than the job being a task, which I find more logical, Slurm calls these processes tasks. So you can ask for a certain number of tasks. Um, so if you do one node, you should still ask for, say, 40 tasks, and you have 40 um, so now, threading is not something that Slurm really knows about. So if you have a threaded application, it will, by default, try and use all of all of the threads. Um, and and this is a, 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 a how shall I say a, a sort of a discord between the scheduler and what actually is running. Um, we have forty cores on each node but we have hyper-threading, so that means we actually uh, count every core twice. The operating system thinks there's 80 cores, and those 80 cores can all be used, but they read, at the end, there's really just 40. Why does it do that? Does that? It turns out that running with more, with overloaded cores is actually faster than just running them once, and it's it's a way of, of making sure that, well, how shall I put this? Say you're running a computation, and at the same time, at some point, you have to write some of that to disk. While you're writing to disk, there's no computation done. If you overload your course with more tasks, while one task is running, is writing to disk, the other task would still be computing. And so it can, it can be beneficial. And this is sort of, to some extent, this is hardware supported. And to the extent it is, we have told all the, all the nodes that they have 80 cores, but they do not. Okay. So Slurm since it's a simple thing, thinks that there are 80 cores. Okay. So if you, want, uh, if, you want, if you want to know how many cores you're really using, and you ask them, hey, how many cores is my job using? And it's one node, it'll say 80, uh, because it doesn't know any better. Uh, we've put in a separate field in Slurm called billing. So if you do uh, S-A-C-C-T, S account, which is actually going to give you uh, what your job is doing or what all jobs are doing. There's a field called billing that actually gives you exactly how many cores, real cores you have, but we had to sort of tweak that in. That's why there's this billing thing. So physical cores is what you will be charged with. If you have an allocation, you will ask for, I want so many cores, and you mean real cores, not hyper cores or something, or hyper threads. Um, but so the way to get that out in, in, uh, in Sturm is, is look at the billing one. And then, so suppose you know, you, you figure that out, and you want to use threaded, you, you want to use these so-called logical CPUs. And you still have to say how many logical CPUs you want. So, um, 
So suppose you want to run one task on one node with the 40 threads. You'd have to say, well, I want 40 logical CPUs in my task, or else it won't do it. Uh, and so you have to set this uh, number of CPUs per task. But then that's just how it's, how it's allocated. Sturm guess, okay, you can get these cores, but your program still doesn't know to use as many cores unless you set this OMP done threads, which is the, 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 the regular way to set the number of threads in an, in an OpenMP variable. I'll show you a few examples in a little while, but um, this might be a useful thing just to cap, keep, like when you're writing your first job scripts, to keep this, this table next to you. Uh, the sites are all on the, on the website, of course, so this, this is just more for reference. So we're going to schedule by node. Because of that, you better use all 40 cores. Uh, but it also makes things a little bit simpler. Um, you ask for one node, you get 40 cores. You ask for two nodes, you have 80 cores. You ask for three nodes, 120 cores. How much memory can my job use? Well, every node has 202 gigabytes of RAM. So I use for one, one node, I can use 202 gigabytes. I don't have to worry too much. Other systems that where they are sharing nodes, um, like Cedar and Graham, you have to specify not only how many cores you want, but also how much memory they will need. And it figures out where it will fit, which is great, um, uh, but more work. and, and, and we don't have to do that. So there is actually no sense in asking for a certain amount of memory in your JavaScript. You can, but it is essentially ignored because you get a number of nodes and the memory that's in it is what you get. So it's kind of similar. Uh, similar with the hyperthreading, you don't have to worry about how many hyperthreads are real cores. So again, I get so many nodes, one node, 40 cores, 80 hyperthreads. It's always the same. So, it's, so if you think of it in terms of nodes, it's actually a very simple system. Uh, we talked about hyperthreading already, so I'm going to skip this one, but it typically gives it a little bit of a speed up. So here's an example, then, given all of that sort of theoretical work, of running a threaded application. So there is one application which can use threads with OpenMP, um, and in this case we're going to not use any hyperthreading, just to keep it simple. Uh, the JavaScript looks like this. It has green lines, they won't be green, I just made them green. Let's start with the uh, pound uh, s patch. And s batch are, are things that are meant for the scheduler. They're starting with a pound sign because this is also at the same time a script. <coughs> Anything that starts with a pound sign is a comment and will be, will be ignored by, uh, by the actual uh, system reading it. So I'm asking for one node, so that's just nodes equal one does that. I'm asking for 40 CPUs per task. So um, now the default is to run one task, so that I don't have to say that, but I could also say dash n task one. I'm asking for an hour, so it's hour, minute, seconds. Um, I can give the, the, the job a name. In this case, I've called it OMP job. And I, I can tell the job where to put output. So um, if there's any output during the job, because it's running on a separate node, on a compute node, that's not a login node. It's not attached to your terminal anymore. Um, it has to put the output somewhere. Uh, by default, it, it puts it in something that's called slurm dash and then the number of your job. Uh, if you want it somewhere else, you can put that here. So in this case, I putting it in OpenP underscore output percent J dot txt. Uh, and percent J here gets replaced by the number of the job. So the job ID, we call that. So that's when I submit this script, the scheduler, the aspect command just looks at the first part. It doesn't look at anything else and goes, okay, from this, I'll figure out what you want. And really it sees, okay, you want one node uh, for one hour. That's really all it cares about. And that's gonna go look for one. It won't have one. It puts in the queue and says, eventually you'll Sort of bubble up in the queue and they'll give you a note and, and then when it does that when it found that note it'll run the rest of the scripts now the script will just run on a new note it's kind of like you've just logged in so you can't really count on being in the directory where you submit it from uh, but if that's where you need to work you have to put some sort of cd commands so in this case if you do cd slurm underscore submit underscore tier it puts you back to the directory that you submitted from. You don't have to do it that way. You could do another way of path, just to do dollar scratch slash whatever, um, right? You, you determine where you run, but you do not want to run in home. So if you run in home, you can't write through the disk system. And for that same system, you have to, the same reason, you have to be careful not to submit this from home either. So if I submit this from home, since I told it to put the output in this file, you'll try to put that file on home. And home is read-only, so it can't. So you either submit from, from scratch or you put uh, a path here that is that is a scratch directory, either way. Um, submitting from scratch is probably the easiest way. Copy 
your JavaScript to scratch, any any data will go in there, submit from that directory, and that's the easiest way to do it. I'm loading the Intel module because it's like I just log in and we have no modules loaded. So you have to load that module again to make sure that everything is working. It's assuming that my application was compiled with uh, with the Intel compiler. Um, and I, I and since this is a threaded application, although I've said that there's 40 CPUs per task, I still have to set this OMP num threads variable again. Um, now, job Sturm will tell you what that variable was. That 40 is encoded in dollar slurm CPUs per task. Um, so you can use that if you want. Uh, makes this a little bit easier in that if you ever change the number of threads, you just change it in one spot. And then you can run your example. If, uh, if you want, you can also run this with S run in front of it. There's not a lot of points here, except um, Slurm can keep track of things like memory usage and, and CPU usage per S run. So if you need that kind of information, this, this can be useful. Um, on the other hand, uh, just running it plainly, you don't need to contact Slurm and, and nothing can go wrong. So this is kind of up to you, but I would just, I wouldn't bother with, with S run here. Does it uh, comes to uh, performance compensation, some overheads? Very little. Very little, but it is. But it does. So, so S run keeps track of everything that happens in that. It calls it a job step, and so if you have several of these, it can be very useful to know. Okay, which step took all that memory? Say you ran out of memory, you got some sort of error. You go, well, which which of the steps were it? If you have S run in front of it, you could actually type S account dash J in your job ID, and it'll give you for every step what happened. So that's nice. But it does mean that ha that now has to be put into a database. And so the overhead is really in, in that. When everything is going smoothly, that's fine. It will take a fraction of a second. Um, when the scheduler is busy, it might hang. So it really depends. Do you need that information? Put it in. But if you don't, if you then, there, yeah. So, so it's a trade-off. And, and occasionally, not often, but occasionally, the scheduler just gets busy period, and your job fails because you did that. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to do that. And uh, similar to GPC, where we want some statistics and the resources, how we can access so, so in the GPC, what we had is when your job stops, your output file would have some information on, on sort of like it took this much memory, uh, I was so such and such efficient, and we do something similar now. So when your job ends, this, this op OpenMP underscore output will have in it uh, 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 sort of a summary at the end of uh, how much memory did you take, how many CPUs, what was like a couple of those things. It, it, it's a lot of information, uh, but it's, it's, it's all there. Um, it'll tell you how it exited, if it exited badly. So, so that's already in the output. Which also means you should not really rely on the output to be the real output. Like real output, you go to a file or you redirect it or something. Um, that gives you a clean distinction between report from the system and things that your job is actually producing. Right? And then if you want it live, or on, then you can use this as account. Uh, yeah. What's the difference between tasks per node and CPUs per task? Are they so, so task per node, that will be the next example. Uh, task per node, or is, it gives you the number of MPI processes. So tasks is kind of restricted to how many processes you want to run. So in this case, I'm running one task. Here it is. And it has 40 threads in it. If I set uh, uh, tasks per node and I set that to 40, then S run will actually start 40 of these at the same time. And if I had still set OpenMP, it will also run 40 threads in 40 of them and overload the, the node, and the poor node will just come to a grinding halt. Um, so so it's, that's why it's important to keep this. A task is an MPI process. If I say how many tasks I want per, per node, that's fine. In this case, I have one node. In the next case, I have eight nodes. I say I want two, 320 tasks in all, but I call, could also say I want 40 tasks per node. So I could do n tasks per node is 40 instead of the n tasks. That's, so I could either ask per, per node or per. Um, but it doesn't do anything with the threading. Yeah. Okay. So this is a pure MPI job. I'm asking for eight nodes. I've computed that the total number of tasks, so MPI processes will be for, uh, 40 times that. Um, after for an hour again, give it a slightly different name, output again. 
same submit directory. In this case, I'm loading the Intel module as well as an open MPI, etc. MPI. And now I can, again, do things in, in a couple of different ways. I can do MPI run, which is sort of the old fashioned way. Um, and it will it'll launch um, exactly as many tasks as here. So MPI run is aware of Slurm. It will ask Slurm, oh, how many tasks did you want? Um, you, could you could type MPI run dash NP 320, like you would in, on, on, on like the GPC, uh, and it would, it would work too. What you cannot do is ask for more tasks to MPI run than you've requested. Slurm will say, no, no way. You ask for this many tasks, you're not getting any more. So it's kind of uh, micromanaging in this way. Um, so you have to set this. But once you've set this, you, could, you might as well use this convenience and say, well, I don't have to specify again how many tasks there are already there on top. On top. Okay. Like with the previous example, I can also run these through srun. srun will realize that this is an MPI task. We will run it through MPI run. And it will keep track of things like memory and, and CPU. So that is nice, but because it uh, it has to contact the database mm -hmm. and stuff, um, especially for MPI, sometimes this fails. And now, if, now uh, eight nodes have to do so. The overhead is basically eight times as fast. And if any of them fails, so at eight nodes, S run is still fine. But if you're running really large scale, uh, you probably want to stick with MPI run. It just tends to scale a little bit better. Um, so this, this call will spawn an instance in each it will like, uh, it, yeah. core. Yes, it, it, that's right, that's right. And the operating system, and all Linux operating systems work this way, will make, it, make sure that everything runs on a separate core. It, it, it divides the work. You don't have to assign. You don't have to be worried that um, you know, one core gets all 320 uh, uh, tasks or anything like that. Um, it will be spread out by default. And even if you ask for less uh, node, less tasks than, no, than, than nodes times 40, so suppose I did uh, eight tasks in this case for eight nodes, it would put each task on a different node. So that could be the case if you need really large memory per MPI process. If you need 200 gigabytes per MPI process, um, you'd, you'd only want one process per node. So you could either say number of tasks per node is one, right? or you could say number of tasks is eight, and in both cases, it will spread them out nicely. So here, in this case, um, the CPUs per task is implicitly set to 40. It is. I, th I think it does that, or maybe 80 even. It basically, it doesn't set anything. Yeah, right, right. So it, it sort of deduces it from, from that. Uh, but, it do but it doesn't set the OMP non-thread variable automatically. So you still, you'd still have to do it. So for hybrid things, you kind of have to you know, do both. So I can also use um, CPUs per task to, you know, if I want to use, if, I, if my programs want to use a large amount of RAM. I think it could. Um, and I want to set CPUs per task to less than 40. Right. Um, essentially, you know, it's just... Yeah, it's, it's just a different way of breaking it up, basically. Yeah. You, you, so you, essentially, now I want eight nodes, but I want only one core per node to be running, but I want right. all the RAM. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I think it's simpler just to say number of tasks per node is one. Yeah. I think that's just, there's no math involved. <laughs> right. yeah. Okay. Questions? So even if you're not running MPI or OpenMP, it still will look the same sort of way. You're probably closer to this one. One node, number of CPUs per task might even be one, uh, but uh, time, job, and it's run whatever you want. Okay, so suppose it's in the queue, and as I said, the queue is always full. The system is pretty much 100% utilized, um, or nodes are waiting for a job to start. Um, how do you figure out what's going on? So there's the SQ command, which gives you all of the jobs in the queue. And the only thing that that gives you is all. Um, other than that, you can look for just your specific jobs. Can you ask you just your, your job ID? And so when you ever you do S batch, it will give you a number back. That number is your job ID. Um, and if you don't know which one it is, you can do sq-u and your username, and it'll just give you your jobs. Um, and you can get information on your job, uh, where it is at, why it's not running, uh, stuff like that. If you want to get an idea of when your job will run, there's this highly uh, inaccurate uh, estimate that you can get from sq doing uh, that's a start, and then that's j, your job ID. Um, take this with a grain of salt, because there are people 
out there with higher priority than you and if they submit your, your job after you uh, if they haven't used the, up their share of the system their job might jump yours this can happen um, once they're done with their their percentage of usage in that I think it's a two-week window they will bump down and they will no longer be able to do that but that's that's the scheduler trying to figure out how everybody can get the share that they've been promised um, if you want to know what your job is doing when it's running uh, there's a kind of convenient uh, uh, little utility job perf and then a job ID uh, but will give you things like uh, especially for multi uh, node jobs will give you by node uh, this is how many CPUs are used in, in this node and how much memory also tell you how much RAM disk is using so if any of you are doing things on RAM disk and occasionally might fill it up it will tell you that it will tell you what is running so you will actually see if there's really 40 uh, of your processes running in your API job for, for, for it's a good it's a good utility um, but only for running jobs obviously um, as cancel if your job has to be cancelled um, you can cancel all of your jobs be careful with that one but you could just by your user uh, username um, and those are for your jobs if you want to get an idea of um, what is available and usually everything is taken but uh, you can do as info p uh, compute uh, compute is the partition for for for, uh, for computing uh, tells you, but that tells you things like if there's any nodes that are down or drained or broken or in like. So if you go, okay, I see there's only forty thousand cores running for some reason, and why is my job not running? It might be that some nodes are down, and you typically are down because something happened and they're going to get rebooted, or surface or a memory module broke or something like that. So that can happen. Uh, it doesn't happen too much now because there's a new system, but it can still happen. Uh, and as account is very useful to get the information on your job. So you can give it a dash J for your job ID and it'll give you all the job steps and memory things or just as account it'll show, tell you the history of all, every job that you had and, and what happened to them and whether they were successful or not. Okay. Right. okay so that's that's running on a on a supercomputer and then a bit of slurm uh, stuff. Uh, data management, which I want to end with. Um, this all kind of comes off from the fact that home, scratch, and project are shared. And uh, so they are large parallel file systems. They, call the file, they use a file system called GPFS. Um, and the nice thing about it is you can see your files from every node, right? So you log into a new node or you, your job runs on, on those eight nodes and every node sees the same files. That's great. It's high performance, but it's really aimed at throughput of large files. So large data sets in parallel from several nodes at the same time, it's, it's, perfectly, it, it's perfect for that. Um, however, what it's not very good at is many small files. The small files actually is not that big a deal, but the many of it and that's tend, tends to happen in a combination. Uh, and why is it, it tends, in essence, because imagine you want to write 100,000 files to a directory from a couple of nodes. Um, because it's shared, as soon as I write a file, um, that directory has changed. And somehow the other nodes that might try to access that directory has have to be informed. And so the way they are informed is that first, they can't do anything. So they try to access that directory and it's locked until the creation of the file is done. Now, if it happens from a few, few nodes at the same time for a few files, that's file, uh, that's fine. But the more files you have, the more locking you have and it slows things down. Um, and and that's bad. And this also happens even in your local machine with like a single hard drive. When you're writing to the same directory with like from a lot of processes at the same time, it will still happen, right? Um, you just not as severe as as it could be at scale. So you want to avoid writing small amounts of data to a shared disk. Um, it also wastes space, but it's also much slower to access everything. They, Writing one big file is faster than writing a whole bunch of, uh, or reading a whole bunch of little files. So don't try not to do that. If there's any way to change your workflow to use less files, that's probably better. Now, if you're at a point where you can't get around that, your data either comes with that many files, or um, you have an application that in every run, uh, you know, creates a thousand temporary files, and you can't get to the code, or, or you, know, you didn't write it. 
Um, there are still a few options, but you do not want them on GPFS. Right? It's going to slow things down. So you either um, change these, the, the location of these little temporary files to RAM disk, which is what we used to do on GPC, um, or to a thing called burst buffer. So this is this fast structure that I, that I explained before. Um, RAM disk, if it fits, is fine, but RAM disk is a piece of the memory that pretends to be a disk. And so whatever you use there goes off of the memory that you're using for your application. Um, so I, I guess it's by default about 100 gigabytes. That's large, right? And a lot of things will fit in there. Um, and that's good. Like if you said, and why is that good? Well, for two of the reasons. One, it's not a parallel file system. So whenever you create a file in RAM, it doesn't have to tell anybody else that it did so. And it's only local to that particular node. And so that means that um, if you do something bad, if you create a lot of files, nobody else feels that. Uh, also, if somebody else does something bad, but it's on RAM disk, then bad in the, same, in the sense of, of, of large I.O., um, nobody else works. So that's nice. Burst buffer is still shared, so you still share the hurt if you do it really poorly, uh, but it is, it is over specs in, in, or lar in a much larger I.O. In the back end, these are SHDs, uh, but it's a much smaller system. That's why we purged it uh, very quickly. So if you if you so look at your workflow, see if if you run into a case where you don't know how to get rid of your thousands or, or millions of files, um, and, and either RAM disk or burst buffer will probably help you out. Um, and it depends on 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 your level of control over over your system. Make sense? We're almost done. So. This is some further information. Um, most of what I talked about is in our Niagara Quick Start, uh, which is both on our own wiki, docs.sina.gibraltar. You will also find most of it on the Compute Canada one, um, for sure. Um, our own website, which has stories, um, but as a user, not, not that much useful information, except if you want to get an account, there's, there's some information on how to do that in there, too. Um, system status, we've decided to put on our wiki as well. So both for this, for for Niagara, but also for the, the, the Blue Gene uh, uh, and the other systems, all the, that's all there. Um, and if you want to know more about what training we have, other things you can learn about uh, running on, on some computers or advanced research computing or biostatistics or parallel programming or uh, databases, you can, you can go there. Um, if you have any questions, email us. Um, you can either use support at sign at the or Niagara at computercanada.ca. Um, 